start. Good evening and a warm welcome to this episode of CCI Masterclass, the brainchild of Dr. Krishna combined with the surgical precision of Dr. Vijay Kumar Chennam Shetty. Whatever progress man may have made, he has to bow down to nature. Going back a hundred years in time to 1918, the world was devastated by the Spanish flu, a misnomer because there is no universal consensus regarding where the virus originated. It is estimated that at least about 500 million or a third of the world's population then became affected, claiming 50 million lives. Come 2019, COVID has ravaged humanity. Then and now, there has been no cure. No other entity in history has been studied in so much detail in so short a time. Vascular complications form the bulk and takes the highest toll in COVID. There's no one better to address this than Dr. Murli Mohan. Dr. B.V. Murli Mohan is a senior consultant pulmonologist and the academic director of the departments of internal medicine and pulmonology at Narayana Hrithalaya, Bangalore. After completing his MBBS and MD in general medicine from Bangalore Medical College, he took wing for the UK where he was awarded MRCP and FRCP. He further went on to successfully take the speciality certificate examination in respiratory medicine conducted by the British Thoracic Society and the Royal College of Physicians. Dr. Murli Mohan's areas of interest in pulmonology lie in obstructive airway disease, interstitial lung disease, and pulmonary hypertension. He has published over 50 papers in journals of repute. More recently, he is a contributing author to the Global Burden of Disease Study and the joint author of the WHO man manual on tobacco cessation. His oratorial skills attract large audiences on both national and international stages. His interests range far beyond medicine and the mundane. His commitment to society is illustrated by him heading the Nightingale's life-saving services, which has to date trained over 30,000 persons in CPR. Dr. Murli Mohan is a quiz whiz, having won twice the state lone wolf championship, as well as the individual round at two national quizzes. He qualified for the final round of Mastermind, the Apex Quiz Show. In his leisure time, he delves in art and poetry, Eku being his obsession. He is also an undiscriminating and omnivorous reader, generally reading four or five books at a time. There's always a twist in a story. However, this one is laced with humor. No offense or pun intended, Dr. Murli. True to being an Indian, he has an abiding interest in cricket, which he used to play with great passion, but all, without any particular distinction. Smart as he is, he married a psychiatrist so as to receive unsolicited lifelong counseling. In the account of children, he is blessed with two daughters whom he loves to distraction. The older one wisely chose not to follow the footsteps of the parents. The younger one did and became a doctor. Ladies and gentlemen, I present to you the popular, articulate and accomplished Dr. Murli Mohan for an intellectually stimulating evening on post-COVID vascular complications. Hi, good evening. I first of all would like to thank Dr. Nasser Yusuf for that, you know, as usual, beautifully phrased, uh, very kind and totally undeserved by me, but it makes me feel good to get such a warm introduction from such a wonderful person. 
such a talented person. I'd also like to express my thanks to uh, the CCI for giving me the second opportunity to do a masterclass. I bring you all greetings from the uh, Narayan Tradyalia Masundar Shaw Medical Center in Bangalore, uh, which is a fairly major center for the handling of both COVID as well as vascular complications in general. And we faced a lot of vascular complications in COVID. So greetings to you all from the Narayan Tradyalia group and from my team who really have been looking after the COVID cases. And as I said, a very special thanks to Dr. Krishna and Dr. Vijay Chennam Chetty, who have invited me to give this talk. So what I'm planning to do is talk to you about two cases. I'll be talking about some of the vascular complications which are common post-COVID, asking why they occur, what are the organs involved, what we should do when we are faced with these problems, or how do we prevent these problems. And through all this, I'll be asking ourselves, is there any evidence for what I'm saying? And right in the beginning, let me tell you that the evidence for anything I'm saying is not strong, just like it has not been strong for anything in COVID. And just like we've been waiting for solid evidence to accumulate right from a year ago, or a little more than a year ago now, when the first cases of COVID were reported. So let me start off with the case of Mr. DB, a 46-year-old gentleman who was diagnosed with COVID pneumonia on the 19th of September, 2020, after three days of symptoms. He'd received three days of treatment outside before he came to us, and this treatment had included remdesivir. He complained of leg pain, investigations for which were normal, he was treated with analgesics there and the pain was relieved. Two days later, he developed abdominal pain. This was the 11th to 12th day of symptoms and a CT abdomen which was done showed thrombosis of the superior mesenteric artery. So the vascular surgeons attempted a catheter directed thrombolysis, but abdominal pain persisted. So he had a repeat CT abdomen. He had a repeat CT angiography and this showed obstruction was persisting with gangrene of the small bowel. So he had an emergency la laparotomy. The gangrenous section of bowel was resected. An end to end anastomosis was performed and a feeding agenostomy was placed. This was done on the 26th of September. So this was about a week after he was first diagnosed. This was his scan. I'm not going to take you through a video of this. Uh, but you can see that there are significant COVID changes and uh, yeah, that's, that's very briefly a video of the whole thing. And there are, as you can see, you know, I'll, I'm not going to waste time pointing it out to you, but take it from me. There were not only obstructions, but you can also see that the uh, muscle there is infarcted. Uh, it was pale and that was the reason for his leg pain. So he had leg pain, he had uh, problems with the superior mesenteric artery thrombosis, and the leg pain was due to involvement of the uh, uh, femoral artery also, a deep branch of it. The second case, Mr. KSR, a 72-year-old gentleman, he had a long history of diabetes and hypertension, which were both poorly controlled. On the 29th of September, he was diagnosed as COVID positive, admitted at a government hospital in Anandpur district. Uh, he was there for some time. On 15th of October, that is almost 17 days later, he tested COVID negative, but his hypoxia persisted. Uh, and he was at home at that point of time, but on the 10th of November, he came to us with worsening breathing difficulty. We did a CT pulmonary angiogram and this showed a saddle thrombus in the pulmonary artery. This was thrombolyzed. He improved, but he was still very symptomatic. And this is his uh, CT pulmonary angiogram from then. And you can see uh, as we go down that he's got, you know, uh, you know, clots in the right main pulmonary artery as well as in the left. So he had bilateral shadows. He had infarcts on both sides. Uh, I'm not going to take you into much more details of that, except to show you that pulmonary artery thrombosis, 
superior mesenteric artery thrombosis, branches of the aorta. And this was another patient who had a brachial artery thrombosis. This is not actually our own patient, but it's, we had a patient with a very similar problem, uh, brachial artery thrombosis, which underwent uh, surgical removal of the thrombus. We've also had patients with renal artery thrombosis and renal infarcts. And this is the same patient's CT of the chest, which shows typical COVID-related changes. So COVID-19, all cases serologically positive and all cases showing significant vascular involvement. And there have been other cases also with cerebral thromboses or emboli involving both deeper structures, white matter structures, gray matter structures, bleeds around the brain, an enormous infarct on the right, on the left, and tiny infarcts all over. So this is a disease which seems to target the blood vessels, as I've shown you, multiple blood vessels, both systemic and pulmonary. This was a Mayo Clinic a systematic review and a meta-analysis with rapid guidance. It came out quite recently, uh, I think in September last year or November last year, more precisely. This is a pooled analysis. It had a lot of papers which are assessed, but I'm just showing you the pooled analysis, which showed that you had a wide variability in the reporting of plots uh, of various types, 2 to 69% in various studies. And therefore, and these were large studies, you know, this was for venous thromboembolism, 2% for DVT, 17% for pulmonary emboli, strokes in 2%, MIs in 1%, and other kinds of thromboses in about 6%. So you had a wide variability of DVT and uh, venous thromboembolism of various types, but showing you that there is a significant risk of venous thromboembolism or other clots, including MIs and strokes, in patients in COVID and post-COVID. So there's this Ian Fleming saying from James Bond. He says once is happenstance, twice is coincidence, three times is enemy action. So I've shown you not three times, but several times. And this is to show you that we're not dealing with just coincidental thromboses, but telling you that there is a truly a link, an enemy action of COVID, which is causing clotting in our system. Of course, Sun Tzu, the famous Chinese general who was considered very successful, but he today is honored because of his classic, The Art of War. One of the important lines there is, know your enemy and know yourself, and you can fight a hundred battles without disaster. So it's very important that we know the enemy, COVID-19, know ourselves, what effect it has on us and our, on our systems, the immune system, the clotting system, and the vascular system. And then hopefully we will have equipped ourselves with the knowledge to fight a hundred battles without disaster. We all know the pathological process in COVID. This has been done to death since the last year or so. We start off with a viral phase with viral multiplication, and that comes down over time. Initially, the patient is asymptomatic. Then they move into mild to moderate symptoms. And this is still where the viral phase is greater than the immune response. But as the immune response gets amplified, the viral phase dies out because the viruses are being killed off by the host immune response. But this is the stage really at which the response is producing a very severe reaction in the host. And the host then becomes critical and he moves from the home or the community to a hospital based or a COVID clinic and then moves into the ICU. And this is typified, and this is important. Initially, lab tests are routinely normal. There is mild lymphopenia, normal blood gases. But as the person moves into a mild to moderate phase, there's lymphopenia. There's an increase in the PT, that is the prothrombin time and or the ferritin and or the D-dimer and or the LDH, which means that any or all of these in, uh, become uh, higher. And there is mild hypoxia greater than 92%. Note two important things, the lymphopenia, changes in clotting parameters, changes in tissue damage, especially of the WBCs, RBCs, and platelets. And as the person becomes more severe, you're seeing a further progressive increase in the D-dimer and the ferritin, indicating ongoing inflammation 
transaminases and triglycerides now start to get worse, suggesting that there is ongoing liver damage, maybe myocardial damage. The blood gases become even more abnormal. So you get hypoxia with the saturation dropping to less than 92%. There's hypocapnia, telling you that the patient is hyperventilating, hungry for air and therefore blowing off CO2. There's a mild increase in the NT pro BNP, telling you that the right heart or the left heart or both are getting strained. The troponin rises, troponin I and troponin T, telling you there's myocardial damage, either due to the myocardial strain or due to myocarditis. IL-6 rises, telling you that there's a strong inflammatory reaction that's going on. The CRP also parallels it, showing you the same thing. Very importantly, note the reduction in the platelet count. And why is this important? It tells you that the platelets are getting activated, getting sticky, sticking to the sides of the blood vessels, sticking to each other, producing thromboses, producing damage to the vessel walls. And this is leading to more and more inflammation. Damage to the intimal lining of the vessels produces endothelial dysfunction. This results in decreased secretion of various vasodilatory factors, leading to further vasoconstriction, blockage and ischemia. And as people get worse, there's a further inflammation, further rise in ferritin, progressive cytopenia, which was already indicated by this rise in triglycerides, telling us that the person is slipping into a hemophagocytic uh, syndrome, an HLH kind of syndrome, and worsening renal function. So all this is a sequence of events Thank goodness it does not occur in everybody, but occurs in those who have severe COVID. And this is the population where there is more likely to be a vascular problem. However, remember that some of our patients are not those who just had severe disease, but sometimes vascular problems occur even in those with mild disease. And that is why we need to think in terms of not just COVID, but also long COVID or what's called long haul COVID. When we say long COVID or long haul COVID, what do we mean? What is the cutoff for saying it's long COVID? So acute COVID may be followed by symptoms even after four weeks. And about 10% of COVID-19 patients experience symptoms beyond three weeks, while 5% of patients have reported experiencing symptoms for eight weeks or more, that's more than two months. And about 2%, two in 100, continue to be ill even after three months. And very worryingly, many of these patients are reported as having only mild COVID right in the beginning, did not need treatment, were managed at home. So we recognize four groups. We recognize those who have a post-intensive care syndrome. These are patients with cognitive disturbances. They have a post-traumatic stress disorder, not surprisingly. They have neuromuscular weakness. They may have post-viral fatigue syndrome. They may have exhaustion, sleep disorders, and joint pain. There's another group of the vascular syndromes, which is going to be the focus of our attention today. Those with acute coronary syndrome, cerebral vascular accidents, pulmonary and systemic thromboembolic disease, and those who may be as a consequence of this go on to develop pulmonary fibrosis. But then there's another important group. These patients have symptoms affecting multiple organ systems. This includes the GI tract, the lungs, the heart, the kidneys, the skin, the brain, and some of these symptoms wax and wane. Are these due to vascular problems? But more probably, they are immune-based inflammatory syndromes, which again operate through the vascular system, because after all, this is what is common to all these systems, the vascular system. And this is what is one of the prime targets of COVID-19, as I shall show you in a subsequent part of this talk. So if you look at post-COVID, virtually every system gets involved. These are all the extra pulmonary manifestations. But remember, right on top, you have thromboembolism. You have a significant wide variation in cardiac abnormalities, stretching from a Takotsubo cardiomyopathy to myocarditis and other cause of myocardial injury, arrhythmias, shock, myocardial ischemia, and acute core pulmonary. You also have other systems being involved, and I won't go into the details of this. But remember that a lot of these are centered around the vascular system, the TKA. Levido reticularis, again telling you that it's vascular. Nerithematis rash, uh, which typically is a vasculitic rash. Urticaria, which again operates through the small vessels. Vesicles and perneolite lesions. Every place it's the vascular system that seems to be the uh, common denominator to all these problems. Let's fast forward this. It's not going to be easily seen. But there's a whole host of things that I shall be talking about later.
And to tell you that COVID-19 seems to have a deadly partnership with vascular comorbidities. So a lot of patients incidentally with COVID-19 have already had a high prevalence of comorbidities before they came in. So it looks like COVID-19 has a more deleterious effect on patients with hypertension who form 50, 17 to 57% of all patients, cardiovascular disease occurring 11 to 21% of patients. And these patients are at greater risk of acquiring the infection, of admission to hospital when they get infected, of progressing to severe disease, of admission to the ICU, and of course of death. And very worryingly, just before I came into this uh, talk, I had a call from a patient whose father is admitted with us. He's a post-transvascular uh, aortic valve uh, repair, uh, also known as TAVR or TAVI. He's had a coronary artery disease. And the son who rang me up today has now tested positive. He's had a previous pulmonary embolic disease and I've been seeing him for five to six years with this. So both of them are at severe risk. The other members of the family are doing well. These two people with pre-existing disease are seen to be going into problems. Classic of what I just mentioned. In a Chinese cohort, 30% had hypertension. And among non-survivors in this group, this is an old study, one of the early studies, a retrospective cohort study, but still very useful because it gave us a lot of information. Among non-survivors, as compared to survivors, hypertension was more common, 48% versus 23% in the survivors and coronary artery disease was much more common, 24% versus 1%. So only 1% of patients who had uh, uh, survived had coronary artery disease, whereas 24% of those who, uh, sorry, let me say that again. Among patients who survived, uh, coronary artery disease occurred in only 1%, whereas patients who survived uh, had 24 76% and patients who died had 24% of them had coronary artery disease. Sorry for that bit of confusion. So this again, a very complex study from Wondal et al. reported towards the end of last year. If I remember right, it was in November in the Journal of Intensive Care. Uh, this looked at all the reports of thromboembolic complications of COVID-19 disease, either single or multi-center studies. They pooled the data and looked at it. And again, you can see VTE in 4.4 to 85.4 percent, wide variability. And again, this depended on where they were reporting from, the COVID wards, OPDs, looking at all patients who were enlisted in a registry or those who came to the ICU. Pulmonary embolic disease, again, wide variability, 6.6 percent .6 to 87 percent. But when you look more specifically, more carefully, microthrombosis occurred in 57 percent. Arterial thromboembolic disease in 2.8 to 8.4 percent. CVA is in 2.5 percent. Acute coronary syndrome is in 1.1 percent. Mesentric ischemia in 0.7 and limb ischemia in 0.66 percent. The lower numbers may be related, you could argue, to anybody with severe disease, any severe disease, but you will agree that the upper levels are clearly associated more commonly with COVID. Having established that vascular complications are common in COVID-19, we should ask ourselves, why are these vascular complications so common? So if you look at what happens, SARS-CoV-2 infects endothelial cells to the angiotensin-converting enzyme 2 enzyme. And what happens, we know that the ACE2 enzyme is located throughout the vascular system. And that is why angiotensin-converting enzyme receptor inhibitors and blockers work so well. So ACE2 is down-regulated, and what this does is it promotes an imbalance between ACE2 and the angiotensin II levels in favor of angiotensin II. And we know that angiotensin II is a very, very powerful vasoconstrictor. So you get a very strong vasoconstrictor activity. But some people believe that it's more, much more than that. Infection also disrupts the endothelial cells, uh, and this contributes to endothelial cell dysfunction. But there's also increasing evidence that the cells which are really disrupted are the pericytes, the cells which line the outside of the vascular system, the capillaries, the arterioles, and the venules. And there is a crosstalk between the pericytes and the endothelial cells. And the pericytes actually keep the endothelial cells healthy. So when the pericytes get affected, that's when endothelial cell dysfunction occurs, not just because of a direct infection of the endothelial cells.
you also have a whole lot of activated macrophages. Now, these macrophages release various cytokines. This causes, as we've been saying for the last year, an immune-mediated cytokine storm, but it also causes vascular inflammation, endotheliolitis, and you get leaky vessels, vascular hyperpermeability, which is possibly what leads to part of the urticaria and the edema that we see in these patients. So there's a whole lot of activated macrophage release syndromes. When you have activated endothelial cells, you actually get an inflammatory cascade and you get mediators which inhibit vasoactive factors like nitric oxide, which we know is a vasodilator. So absence of the vasodilator substance leads to vasoconstriction and it leads to increased vascular permeability. I already mentioned that the platelets get activated, which is why they get sticky. They stick to the sides of the vessels, which is why your platelet count comes down. And that's actually one of the key factors we've seen throughout platelets coming down, not maybe as much as in dengue, but certainly with significant thrombocytopenia. And the degree of thrombocytopenia often reflects the severity of the disease. Not only did the platelets get activated, the endothelial cells also get activated, and this leads to thrombosis and embolism. This beautiful paper from Ackerman et al., which came out, I think, in about March or no, July of last year. Uh, looked at just six autopsy cases, but these were beautifully worked up. And these were some of the earlier studies which looked at the vascular component during their autopsies. And what they showed was, you can see the blood vessels showing lymphocytic inflammation, a heavy infiltration of lymphocytes. If you look at the pulmonary capillaries, you see microthrombi within them with fibrin and RBCs within the alveoli, telling you that there's vascular damage and leakage into the alveoli. You also see what is called sprouting angiogenesis, and you can see in another term into susceptive angi angiogenesis, and you can see these changes within the vascular system. And interestingly, these were also able to show that there are, uh, can you see, I'm not sure how well you can see these black dots there. Those are the co coronavirus particles within the vascular system. So you can see the red cells, and you can see the lining capillaries and what you're seeing is into susceptive angiogenesis where the walls of the capillaries grow within the capillary producing a kind of septum or partition within the capillary obviously decreasing the uh, cross-sectional surface and slowing down flow and you get new vessel formation what is called sprouting angiogenesis which again is very poor uh, poorly or thin vascular walls, poorly formed vascular walls. So you get new vessel formation, which is a very unhealthy kind of cell. You also get a wide variety of blood uh, markers, which are abnormal, signaling that there is inflammation, routine analysis showing you a whole lot of penias, biochemistry showing you a lot of tissue damage, and blood clotting, sorry, not clothing. This came from a Chinese report, so you can forgive English, not their first language. So a huge rise in the D-dimer. And, you know, whenever you had these, there was a significant relative risk ratio of uh, severe outcomes and death. So this was all for patients who died with these problems. And you can see that most of them, you can get uh, a significant signal that there is activation of cells, thrombocytopenia, for example, 1.86 times, procalcitonin being advanced 2.94 times, CRP being elevated, signaling inflammation, tissue damage, and a rise in D-dimer one and a half times. What exactly is happening? We know now that the immune system, the inflammatory pathways, and the coagulation pathways are all closely linked. And you can see here is a clotting pathway. Here is the complement system. Here is the calicrine kinin system, which incidentally came in for a lot of attention. The bradykinin and hypothesis, as opposed to the other hypotheses, which looked at only the inflammatory markers uh, and the fibrinogen system. And here you have the fibrinolytic pathway. And all of them seem to be linked through factor 12a, which is one of the beginning features. And this gets triggered off when artificial surfaces or collagen are linked to poly-P that is the polyprotein, uh, polymeric protein that gets activated, activating a variety of proteins. And in each of them, you get uh, increase in the activity, 
leading finally to damage by the complement system. You know, the complement system makes holes in the surrounding uh, capillary membranes and basement membranes. You get coagulation, you get inflammation, and you get a fibrin degradation, which is an indication that the clotting is going on and initiating sometimes a disseminated intravascular coagulation. Hence, there is a multifactorial pathogenesis of coagulopathy in COVID-19. Okay, I'm not going to take you through this very busy slide, except to tell you that you have, as end result of all these, the cytokine storm, the immune system, extrinsic coagulation, virus-mediated damage, as well as ARDS-mediated hypoxic vasoconstriction, hypoxia, uh, ec ECMO, uh, also leading to the inflammation and a variety of comorbidities. All these together. Uh, can lead to hypercoagulopathy, sepsis-induced coagulopathy, disseminated coagulopathy, and microangiopathy. So there's a whole host of changes that congregate and produce this problem. There is a old triad described by the very great Rudolf Furkoff. Uh, we call it Furkoff's triad. There are changes in the vessel wall. There are changes in blood flow and changes in blood. And these together lead to thrombosis. How does this translate? How does Verkoff's triad translate into COVID-19? So we have the changes in the vessel wall, vascular endothelitis. You have changes in the blood flow, which lead to endothelial dysfunction. And you have changes in the blood itself with platelet activation, viral RNA being produced in large amounts, DNA, what are called neutrophil extracellular traps, von Willebrand factor getting activated, factor 9A, and thrombin fibrin meshwork finally. And these are changes in the blood. And the role of the neutrophil excess extracellular traps is becoming more and more important in more and more conditions. Just yesterday, I was reading a paper on its importance in bronchiectasis. So we find that it has a role to play in a variety of conditions. There are pulmonary vascular consequences of COVID. I'm not going to again take you through all these, but to tell you except that there is a symptoms which are very similar between COVID-19 and pulmonary hypertension. I'm sorry. So both of them are typified by dyspnea and fatigue. Both of them have degrees of inflammation, though it's much more in COVID-19 as compared to pulmonary hypertension. There is thrombosis and microthrombi, again more in COVID-19, but not unknown in pulmonary hypertension. There's damage to DNA, much more in uh, pulmonary hypertension. Angiotensin system gets activated, the renin angiotensin aldosterone axis. There is injury to the heart, more in later phases of pulmonary hypertension, and changes in the pulmonary vascular system, including mitochondrial dysfunction, production of reactive oxygen species, endothelial dysfunction, and all these uh, hypoxic pulmonary vasoconstriction, and all these are seen in both conditions. So there's a lot of similarity between COVID-19 and pulmonary hypertension. And not surprisingly, there's a lot of very similar changes or complications of both conditions. So these are the similarities I was talking about and this uh, paper by Portis et al is well worth reading. If you look at cardiovascular disease, again, not gonna take you through this busy slide, except to say that there is ST segment elevation, a lot of them, and I showed you one of those patients. Many go into decomposited heart failure when they already have some degree of cardiac damage. Some of them slip directly into cardiogenic shock. And heart transplant recipients seem to be particularly hardly hit, hard hit, sorry, but they were hardly involved, thank goodness, because they took extra care of not exposing themselves to infection, which unfortunately a lot of people, a lot of people who did not have comorbidities expose themselves to. So what do you do when you have a patient with uh, suspected or diagnosed COVID-19, when they get admitted, obviously you take all the usual precautions. You do a chest X-ray, you search for COVID and you follow up with the CT chest or the CT pulmonary angiogram. And then you decide is COVID positive or not. If the COVID is diagnosed, you decide whether they can be hospitalized or they can be managed as an outpatient. And then you go on. What I really wanted to show you is patients who end up in the ICU often have a CT angiogram or a CT chest and we need to follow this up with perhaps an aorto and pulmonary angiogram, ultrasounds, and you may have to 
deal with solid organ infarcts, brain infarcts, and you may have to do a brain MRI. So there's a whole host of imagings that we may have to do to follow up these patients, which obviously is difficult in somebody on a ventilator, but also possibly the big problem is attached to the cost of an already very expensive disease. Let me show you one very interesting paper. Uh, this was a multi-author uh, paper. It was more a perspective and looking at the future, but it was basically telling us and showing some evidence uh, speculating about the need for VQ scan, but more importantly, SPECT, uh, VQ SPECT in patients with uh, COVID-19. And they were describing three possible outcomes. On the left, you have a, a VQ SPECT, which shows you normal looking lungs, normal looking vascular system. In the middle, you have those with classic vascular involvement, pulmonary vascular involvement due to thromboembolic disease. So you see segmental involvement by this spect. But there's this third group who don't have this kind of classic um, wedge-shaped abnormalities which are seen in the edges of the lung. So wedge-shaped opacities in the edges of the lung on a CT or a chest X-ray or similar abnormalities on a spect will tell you you're dealing with obstruction of low bar or segmental or subsegmental vessels. On the other hand, what is seen very often in COVID-19 is these peripheral lesions not corresponding to a vascular territory running across vascular territories and suggesting that these is, this is a kind of small vessel vasculopathy that is occurring and not a classic uh, wedge-shaped opacity due to a low bar or a segmental involvement. And they have termed these microclots, microvascular, COVID-19, lung vessel obstruction, and thromboinflammatory syndrome, a very catchily named uh, acronym, microvascular, micro, clots, COVID-19, lung vessel, obstructive, thromboinflammatory syndrome. And the article is titled Beyond the Clot. And basically what they are saying is that in venous thromboembolism and in C2 small vessel pulmonary thrombosis, may be seen in COVID-19, and these may, in future, lead to a chronic thromboembolic pulmonary hypertension. The problem with this is this is small vessel disease and may not be amenable to um, surgery, which is the best kind of treatment for CTEF. You have lung perfusion abnormalities. There may be classic segmental abnormalities, but there may also be distal small vessel related deficits, which may be underestimated on CT pulmonary angiogram. As I already mentioned, you can do a ventilation perfusion planar scintigraphy, but you may also be finding it useful to do a VQ SPECT to assess residual blood flow limitation. And more and more people are finding that dual energy CT studies of chronic thromboembolic disease correlates very well, has good concordance with VQ imaging. So, Finally, what do we do with these patients? When you have a patient with COVID-19, you obtain a baseline prothrombin time, D-dimer, fibronogen, and platelet count. Then you assess the bleeding risk. If the bleeding risk is low or acceptable, and you assess the bleeding risk very often by doing a Hasblet score, and I'll come back to this soon. If the bleeding risk is low or acceptable, you encourage the person to mobilize, of course, you initiate thromboprophylaxis with unfractionated heparin or low molecular weight heparin. And this is from the Mondel study that I showed you earlier. This, remember, is a personal opinion and not in the guidelines yet. If, on the other hand, the bleeding risk is high, you encourage them to mobilize. You use sequential compression devices like pneumatic compression stockings when they're not ambulating or they're unable to ambulate. But because they have a high bleeding risk, you don't give them thromboprophylaxis with heparin or other similar agents. You do an active routine screening for venous and arterial thrombosis wherever it is, and you need to do this on an ongoing basis. So you do some clinical radiological surveillance, and more importantly, you check the trend of their D-dimers. When they screen positive on any of these imaging or biomarkers, then you have a very high suspicion of occult microthrombosis. And now, you may think that the risk-benefit ratio, instead of holding thromboprophylaxis, you move into therapeutic anticoagulation, or instead of giving low-dose thromboprophylaxis, you move into open therapeutic ambulation, uh, anticoagulation, 
with unfractionated heparin or low molecular weight heparin. And you, I'm very sorry, I have to uh, cut off that call. Uh, and you titrate it according to the APTT and the, or the anti-10A levels if you're using low molecular weight heparin. You reassess the bleeding risk routinely. Unfortunately, there's insufficient evidence to uh, recommend initiating therapeutic anticoagulation based on D-dimer cutoffs only. But increasingly, expert opinion suggests that the D-dimer of 3000 and above is associated with a very high risk and may be sensible to offer thromboprophylaxis at least at that stage, if not therapeutic anticoagulation. And then in the long term, you can transition to either a VKA, a vitamin K antagonist, a coumarin. You may keep them on unfractionated heparin, or you can use one of the direct oral anticoagulants, DOAC, on discharge. But please be aware of drug interactions, antivirals, and antiplatelets. And when you're using an antifibrotic like an intidanib, be careful that there is a risk of bleeding when you use an anticoagulation along with uh, nintadanib. In all these patients, again, unfortunately, there's insufficient data on long-term outcomes, but Mondel et al., and in fact, I would agree with some of this, is three to six months in the absence of risk factors is what you need to do in the setting of additional risk factors if a patient has, uh, how long to keep a patient on anticoagulants. So keep them on anywhere from six weeks to three months. An average of six to 12 weeks perhaps is quite sensible to keep them on some form of anticoagulation or at some point in between transition to an antiplatelet. So this was again, going back to the Mayo Clinic clear, uh, recommendations, another recommendation if the patient is already on a treatment dose of, uh, so this is for, sorry, uh, VTE prophylaxis in the hospitalized patient. Ask yourself, is the patient on a treatment dose of warfarin or DOAC for any reason? If yes, and if an, anti, uh, an invasive procedure is anticipated, you have to decide on continuation versus transition to a therapeutic heparin uh, while you do the procedure and then come back to either the oral anticoagulant or continue with the therapeutic heparin. If there is no previous anticoagulation already that the patient is on, you ask yourself, is there a contraindication to VTE prophylaxis? If yes, then you apply the pneumatic compression stockings, as we said earlier, discuss with your hematology consultant and reconsider VTE prophylaxis after contraindication is corrected. But if there is no contraindication, you ask yourself, if the patient have prior heparin-induced thrombocytopenia, either active or previously hit, the patient has a history of HIT and the patient has a good creatinine clearance, you prescribe the patient fondaparinux. The patient has a low creatinine clearance, you cannot use fondaparinux. You may choose to use that uh, block, which is sequential compression device, and consider VT prophylaxis if you can correct the patient later. And then you decide to perform laboratory tests and imaging. This is till then you decide uh, to hold the prophylaxis until you have taken these decisions. Next question, if you decide to give the treatment is ask yourself, where is the patient? If the patient is in the clinical ward, you use prophylaxis again with LMWH or unfractionated heparin. We tend to use enoxaparin in lower weight patients once a day and in higher weight patients twice a day. If it's unfractionated uh, heparin, our preferred dose is 5,000 units uh, eight hourly or in thinner, smaller weight patients, 5,000 units twice a day. In the very obese, we give them 7,500 units three times a day. And in those who are in the ICU rather than the wards, you check the ultrasound Doppler scan. If there is a DVT, you decide to give them therapeutic anticoagulation and you may con continue that for anywhere from three, to, uh, three weeks to six weeks. Uh, and these people have said six weeks. If there is, uh, sorry, if, if there is a DVT, you continue, continue it for three to six months, not three to six weeks. If the patient has no DVT, you assess the risk for developing a venous thrombobolism. And as I mentioned earlier, the cutoff many people use is 3000 units or three micrograms per ml. If it is less than that, you give them venous, uh, venous thromboembolism prophylaxis. Whereas if it is more than three, you tend to give them higher doses, 40 milligrams BD of enoxaparin or a higher dose 5000 TID of unfractionated heparin. You monitor and you follow up in the long term. 
The Mayo Clinic team suggests an improved VTE risk score calculator. And if it is high, you consider extending venous thromboembolism prophylaxis. Is prophylactic anticoagulation really useful in practice? Because a lot of people have been following it. Uh, we have been following it and we started it well before strong evidence came on based purely on the science of the thing. And I know a lot of people are against this and I cannot argue with them because there is no evidence. And people who demand evidence very strongly are perfectly in the right to demand evidence. However, we felt that given the knowledge of the pathology of this condition, the fact that it works through clotting, the fact that even patients with mild to moderate disease have often had uh, nasty thrombotic episodes, sometimes death. This may happen very suddenly even after they've been discharged. We felt that when the risk for a bleeding episode was low, we would rather give them anticoagulation. And I'll show you the protocol that we use, that we designed ourselves. Uh, but fortunately now we have good evidence. This was a paper published in the BMJ Open quite recently. A nationwide cohort of uh, uh, veterans administration patients. These are ex-servicemen in the United States. Uh, they looked at about 4,200 odd patients admitted with lamp confirmed severe SARS-CoV-2 infection who had not previously been on anticoagulation, but who had started on prophylactic anticoagulation within 24 hours of admission. Their main outcome was a 30-day mortality. The secondary outcomes they looked at, which in my opinion are also important, were inpatient mortality, very, very important outcome. Initiation of therapeutic anticoagulation, which they used as a proxy for clinical deterioration, including thromboembolic events. So somebody who started on prophylaxis moved on to therapeutic anticoagulation. That means they got worse. And bleeding that required transfusion. One of the main arguments of people who don't want to give uh, anticoagulation is the reported risk of bleeding events. And nobody can deny that when you use an anticoagulant, there is always going to be a risk of bleeds. And therefore, it's very important for us to do a risk-benefit ratio before we would use an anticoagulant. So this were the results of their study. This was one of the prime uh, endpoints, the primary endpoints, 30-day mortality. And the probability of 30-day mortality was much higher when you did not give them anticoagulation as compared to those who did receive anticoagulation. And you can see that the lines start to separate so soon. Within two days, you're already seeing a difference telling you that thrombosis is occurring early in patients with severe COVID-19. I'll remind you that this is severe COVID-19 hospitalized patients. We are not yet, uh, you know, demonstrating evidence of that in mild to moderate disease. But here are patients with severe disease and very early you're seeing a difference between those who received prophylactic anticoagulation within 24 hours and those in whom it was delayed which means the anticoagulant good effect starts early, a hazard ratio of 0.73 if you gave them prophylactic anticoagulation. This was a 30-day mortality. The same thing happens with inpatient mortality. Again, early separation of the two uh, curves and maintained throughout the days of hospital admission. Almost the same hazard ratio, 0.73 there, 0.69 here, virtually no difference. And those who developed complications and needed to go on to therapeutic anticoagulation, if you gave them prophylaxis, again, a little later, you saw the difference. Obviously, the shift happened a little later. But even here, you're seeing it happen within the first five to seven days. You're seeing a benefit of early institution of prophylactic anticoagulation. This is our protocol. We obviously we'll first highlight the contraindications, end-stage renal disease, active bleeding, emergency surgery, those who have very low platelets and a blood pressure which is very high. In admitted patients with this is mild, this is moderate, and this is severe disease based purely on their oxygen saturation, uh, but also taking into account their inflammatory markers. So a very, very high neutrophil lymphocyte ratio greater than 17 a very high D-dimer greater than 3000, a very high LDH or a very high CRP. We use these also to define whether patients were in mild, moderate or severe disease. Those with milder disease, we either gave them enoxaparin, 40 milligrams OD for five days or dabigatran or 
when we did not want to use these or a patient was already on antiplatelet agents, we continued them on aspirin or clopidogrel or whichever they were taking earlier, along with atorvastatin, increasing evidence that statins are very effective for endothelial dysfunction. They have pleomorphic effects. So that is why we decided to use statins also. Is there evidence for statins? Very, very sketchy evidence. There are a couple of papers, no strong evidence, which is why I didn't put it down. Moderate disease, again, we use enoxaparin once daily or daltaparin 2,500 units. So low dose uh, thromboprophylaxis or unfractionated heparin 5,000 units twice daily if the person has uh, end-stage renal disease. In severe uh, disease, we use a twice daily dose of enoxaparin. We use a higher dose if the patient is overweight or daltaparin. And in end-stage renal disease, we'd up the dose of unfractionated heparin. So this is our protocol. Some people have suggested using criteria for severity, very similar to what we use, people with tachypnea, saturation less than or equal to 93%, which is why we use a cutoff of 94%, a PO to FIO2 ratio of less than 300, so they're slipping into an ARDS kind of picture, and radiological evidence of pulmonary impairment of greater than 50%, which has occurred over 24 to 48 hours. You also can use the International Society of Thrombosis and Hematology score, severity index for COVID-19 score. And they use similar platelet count. They use the INR and the SOFA score, each one getting one to two points, depending on the severity of the disease. And using the score, you can calculate whether you want to give the person thromboprophylaxis or not. So if the SIC score is greater than or equal to four, then you can decide to uh, give the patient therapeutic anticoagulation. Otherwise, you give the person prophylax prophylaxis or none at all. For the bleeding, we use the Hasblad score. Remember that the Hasblad score has been val validated for warfarin, but not for the newer anticoagulants. And we are just extrapolating it at this uh, stage to use it for anticoagulants. There are other bleeding risk scores like the Oasis outpatient risk score. You can use any one of these because none of them has been validated for the DOAX. Uh, and this is the way you use it. It's available on the internet, so I'm not going to go into it, but you can see as the score goes up, the bleeding risk goes up, and you will have to therefore counterbalance the risk of bleeding versus the risk of thrombosis. And when you think the risk of thrombosis exceeds the risk of bleeding, then it's a good idea to give thromboprophylaxis. If you think the risk of bleeding exceeds the risk of thrombosis, then don't give the prophylaxis. I'll stop at this stage take you through a few key points that I want you to uh, remember, some key messages from my talk. And of course, thank you to Dr. Nasser Yusuf. Thank you to the CCI's uh, key team, the Brains Trust, Dr. Uh, Krishna, Dr. Vijay Chenam Chetty, the president and others, Dr. Dosi and so on. For these key messages, COVID-19 has a unique laboratory signature including thrombocytopenia with elevated fibrinogen and fibrin and D-dimer, which are associated with poor outcomes. So remember that this laboratory signature should signal that these patients have a poor outcome. Remember that vascular complications are common during COVID-19, during the acute phase, and they may continue for several weeks into the post-COVID phase. So vascular complications encompass a whole range of problems, COVID, acute post-COVID, and long or chronic post-COVID. The causes are multifactorial. They involve the interrelated immune, inflammatory, and coagulation pathways. And increasingly, you have evidence that the bradykine and calicrine pathway is also involved. And this is apart from direct infection of the pericyte endothelial complex. So you have not only the direct infection by the virus, but also the response to the virus, which involves the inflammatory immune coagulation pathways that contribute to the deadly vascular complications. Thrombotic outcomes, it's well recognized, add to the morbidity and mortality of this condition, which adds to the argument that VTE prophylaxis may help. But remember that this requires assessing the risk of thrombosis and the risk of major bleeding. However, it is still unclear if the usually used scores for both thrombosis and major bleeding apply in COVID-19. But till we can get more evidence, we'd like you to make up your mind on an individual patient basis, keeping an open mind, but equally assessing the risk 
of thrombosis, which can leave the person with major problems in the long run, even after they have re recovered from acute COVID-19. Thank you all very much. Crisp, crystal clear, lucid, clarity over confusion, presented in a very soothing, convincing, and pleasant voice. That was Dr. Murli Mohan. And welcome live, Dr. Murli Mohan, to the Sir. episode on CCI. It was really overwhelming and mesmerizing. Would you like to have any? comments to share with us? Nothing really. I think what I needed to say, I said in the talk, except to say that, you know, having a moderator like you is actually pretty awe-inspiring. You spoke about clarity and crispness. I think I have nobody better to follow than you. Are you, uh, have you any questions yet? Okay, we have a question from Bareilly, Dr. Yogesh Kumar Sahani, all of course directed to Dr. Murli Mohan. Is coagulopathy can occur after three months of COVID-19? I shall rephrase that. Uh, can coagulopathy occur after three months after COVID? We don't really know. We know that most of the trials or rather the studies that have been reported have reported up to three months. I have not seen any major description of problems going on for longer than three months, but there's no reason to, to think that this is not going to be possible in at least a few cases. We know that the risk comes down over time, is highest in the first couple of weeks during the acute COVID. It comes down a little in the next uh, three weeks to 12 weeks. That is the first three months. And after three months, probably drops even more. Our experience with COVID has been that you can have the most frightening uh, CT changes in the lungs, which look like the person will never recover in the first three months. And we see dramatic changes after that, where the person improves. Some of this tells us that, yes, there is a bit of fibrosis and it is a bit of residual fibrosis. But a lot of the changes that are happening or happened initially are due to inflammation and due to small vessel vasculopathy. And a lot of this is reversible. Now, does this really uh, tell you that there is going to be no risk in predisposed individuals? I don't think so. I think you are going to see continued risk, and this may go on for six months or so, which is why in people with high risk, it is advisable to anticoagulate for at least three months. And at that point in time, discuss whether you want to continue it for a further three months, that is for six months. Another question again to you, Dr. Murli. Can you hear me? Yes, sir. Clearly. Uh, like uh, retinal artery thrombosis. Is it possible post-COVID? Have you seen any cases? I haven't seen any cases. I haven't read of any cases. But all I'd say is since cerebral arteries, the carotids and their branches can be involved, uh, I have no reason to think that the retinal artery also cannot be involved. So I think we should keep that possibility in mind. I can only say I've, I've not seen any case reports of that. A comment and a question from Dr. CVK. I, can't, I don't know what K stands for. Forgive me for that, uh, Mr. Dr. CVK. He's from Telangana, Hyderabad. Excellent talk, Dr. Murli. Sir, dear Nasir, sir, can you please throw some light on how to enrich out-of-box thinking among pul pulmonologists. This is in questions in relation with your recent, okay, tomophobia. I'll answer that subsequently. Um, I'll take that call on tomophobia. Uh, another question, again, from Telangana, Dr. Sweda, Hyderabad. 
Um, can we give prophylactic anticoagulants in mild cases of COVID in high risk cases? I think you've already addressed it, but maybe you could uh, clarify once more. So the mild case is the big uh, query. I don't think in my mind there's any doubt that the severe COVID-19, and now we have evidence that severe COVID-19 needs to be anticoagulated. The big debate would be, is it therapeutic or prophylactic anticoagulation? The moderate case, I think, is again fairly clear. You have to use uh, prophylactic anticoagulation. Now, the mild case, my own personal belief, not supported by any evidence, but going by anecdotal stories of people who had uh, mild COVID-19, including some of our own patients, but who a couple of weeks later or a month later, the second case that I presented was fairly mild and actually developed a very severe complication. Now, was this related directly to the COVID-19 or was it because, you know, these, these patients have spent time in bed, they have an increased coagulopathy and would have happened in any uh, moderately severe illness? Not very sure. But I would suggest that you should use, if there is no contraindication, low-dose anticoagulation or a combination of aspirin and statins. My own preference is to use aspirin and statins for the simple reason that we are seeing a lot of evidence that there is platelet activation and therefore the use of an antiplatelet agent and something that stabilizes the endothelium would probably be better than an anticoagulant. Also perhaps safer. So my own preference for mild cases is to use an aspirin or clopidogrel combined with a statin and give that for about six weeks. And in certain cases where there is a high underlying risk, extend it to three months. Completely my personal opinion and has nothing to do with evidence. Dr. Monika Bindu from Hyderabad, role of apixaban and dosage and duration in prophylaxis and treatment. So apixaban has been used. We also have used it. Uh, the dose for uh, prophylaxis, if you're giving it for mild cases, would be 2.5 milligrams twice daily. And when you're using it for treatment would be after an initial 10 milligram dose, give 5 milligrams twice a day. That is the dose we use. Uh, and at some point, uh, if we are convinced that the person is over the risk phase, we move them to a 2.5 milligrams once daily, follow them up and then stop it. But the dose really should be given twice daily. So 2.5 milligrams twice daily. It's a very safe uh, anticoagulant, one of the NOACs. It is possible that you can get uh, an antidote for it, which is Andexanet, but that's not widely available. So by and large, we tend to use Dabigatran because we have Idrasuzumab as the antidote. Dr. Aniket Gangolde from Nasik, role of urokinase in severe COVID with high D-dimer. Your take, Dr. Mullin? I wouldn't use it at all. I think, you know, it's not just a double-edged sword, but I think you're asking for trouble. If there is demonstrable clot, you can consider using it definitely. But just a high D-dimer, I think, does not justify using a uh, thrombolytic agent like urokinase or indeed any of the thrombolytic agents. I've not seen any reports that suggested it should be used. I've never seen any case reports where it was used, so I would certainly not use it. Great. This is from Dr. Ambika. I mean, I think you've already answered this, but however, she needs a clarification. For post-COVID vascular complications, is there any particular marker which can help in predicting before itself? So I think I would go with one of the uh, scores uh, and you could use either the scores I mentioned or some people, for example, I think I mentioned this when I spoke also, the Mayo Clinic uses the improved DD score. Uh, I don't think there's any head-to-head -head comparison of any of these scores. They all give you similar information, maybe a percentage this way or that. So I would use a scoring system rather than a single marker. We know that the D-dimer can remain high. Where the D-dimer as a single marker may be useful is after you have withdrawn therapy. And this comes from our experience with acute pulmonary embolism, where you have given the three to six months of treatment uh, in a provoked clot. You withdrawn the treatment. One month later, you do, do a D-dimer. If the D-dimer is elevated at this point, then you can consider reinstituting prophylaxis uh, 
because these people are at very high risk of having a recurrent pulmonary embolism. Uh, apart from that, I think it is wiser to use a combined score in COVID or post-COVID, even going on for six months for long COVID. Even if you, uh, you know, have a suspicion, I would use an objective or a semi-objective measure like a scoring system. Dr. Sunita Kumbalkar from Nagpur has a very practical question for what is the treatment of superficial thrombophlebitis in COVID-19? I suspect you are a better person to answer that, but I would say you don't really need to treat it. Uh, you can use an anti-inflammatory agent. You would look very hard for evidence of clotting elsewhere. I would not be averse to using uh, aspirin and clopidogrel, or if I felt that this patient for other reasons fell into a high-risk group, I would use thromboprophylaxis. Apart from that, I don't think there really is any treatment for superficial thrombophlebitis. Interestingly, I haven't seen any except in the context of a, a pre-existing catheter that was there and it is catheter-related local thrombophlebitis. Generally, thrombophlebitis need not be treated. And I think that holds true for COVID-19 too. Yeah, or maybe you could use some thrombophobe ointment. Sounds very simple, but uh, you know, you feel you're doing something and sometimes the patient feels happy too. Now, a little trickier question for you. Uh, I think it's, uh, I'll go to the question first. Because there's a flood of questions coming in, so it keeps moving up and down. Whoa. Let's see it. To decide on aspirin versus dabigatron on discharge, how would you do that? That was from, uh, I think, Dr. Okay, you go on. I'll find that name. How will you decide on dabigatron or aspirin? So, if I, you know, this is completely a uh, subjective response. Uh, if somebody has already been on an antiplatelet agent or a dual antiplatelet agent, my tendency is to just continue it. If a person has not been on any treatment, and I think the risk is high, as indicated by rising markers, as indicated by uh, pre-existing risk factors, person with multiple comorbidities, uh, then I would probably institute anticoagulation and at some dabigatran being one of them, and then thinking of moving to aspirin. On the other hand, if a person had a proven pulmonary embolism, we must remember, despite the widespread use of the NOACs, including dabigatran, the evidence is really with the older warfarin and the other coumarins. Sure. So our tendency is to use the coumarins uh, for two reasons. One is the evidence and the other is that you're assuming that because it worked in many of the trials for atherosclerotic thrombosis, it's going to work for pulmonary embolism also. There is no very good evidence that treating acute PE with the NOAX actually translates into lower risk of future chronic thromboembolic disease. So our tendency is to use the older anticoagulants in patients who have higher risk of disease. Uh, but if they have already got an anticoag, I'm sorry, an antiplatelet agent, we would continue the antiplatelet agent. Is dabigatran less preferred over the other NOACs in post-COVID? I mean, no, I don't think there's any good evidence that any of them is effective in post-COVID. There's no evidence that any one of the NOACs is significantly better than the other, except in isolated in uh, indications, for example, rivaroxaban in malignancy-associated clotting. Uh, otherwise, there's really no good evidence that one is significantly better than the other. One of the things that makes a difference to my use of them is the cost. And second, the availability of a antidote uh, in, the pre in, in the case of Navigatran. Uh, but apart from that, really very little evidence that one is significantly better than the other. That was from Dr. Sudhir Hyderabad. I think I'll give you a break, Dr. Murli. And I have, have a question. Please hear your tomophobia, sir. <laughs> uh, I'll take that later. This is something from uh, Will Thoracoscopy Help in Bronchic Thesis? Dr. Bandaru Ram Kumar, Raman uh, Andhra Pradesh, Eluru. Would you like to take that question or would you? No, no, I, I, think, I think you're the expert on that, sir. 
Yeah, it's a very relevant question, very extensive, but the simple answer to that in, in a word would be yes. Thoracoscopy, now it depends on what, from a surgical point of view, we would use that for surgical excisions, but if at all there's a doubt in the mind of a medical thoracoscopist about, uh, say, the, um, any infection localized, or is there a rupture, or is there paranemonic effusion causing empyema? Uh, any of those doubts. When you doubt, go in. It's simple as that. However, safety first. It's better to be safe than sorry. Don't take a chance. But if you have a doubt, you're confident, you're competent, you could go in. And another thing which I would like to bring to your attention is, uh, obviously, you're a very advanced therapist is that when you go in, if there's bronchitis, you clear the mouth around it, if there's empyema or some fibrin, is you would see knobby, nodular surfaces. And that raises suspicion of a locally, how do we identify bronchitis? Uh, but largely, we use it for video-assisted thoracoscopic surgery or segmentectomy and lobectomy. I hope I could uh, satisfy to some extent your query and your curiosity and probably, I know you're looking for encouragement to put in the scope next time. <laughs> Good luck to you with your procedures, uh, Dr. Bandaru. Now back to you again, Dr. Murli. Can't give you too much of a respite. We have encountered few cases, few, where persistent elevations of D-dimer even at six months. Now, what would you do in this situation? Suggestions, like I was, Meant to ask that question, you took my breath away. And that is again from that smart guy, uh, Dr. CVK. I you know, you have all those other hypercoagulable states like protein S deficiency, uh, alpha phospholipase antibodies. Uh, good question. Uh, should we do them routinely if it persists? I suspect that's Dr. Vijay Kumar Chanam Chetty. That would be my. Uh, suspicion. <laughs> yes, you solve the mystery. CBK Excellent here. question. No real answer, except to say that uh, one never goes by a single marker. Uh, I think it would be dangerous to use a single marker, except in the instance that I quoted earlier. But if a person had evidence of ongoing inflammation, as indicated by any of the inflammatory markers, but more than one, then I would probably want to continue the anticoagulation. Uh, and, you know, reassess once in three months on the duration, repeat the D-dimer. And you can also do this after stopping the anticoagulant and reassessing it. But yes, I think we are seeing patients who continue to show D-dimers, not in the range that we spoke about earlier, 3000 plus, but closer to the 850, 900 mark. And this persists for several months after the recovery. If they also have an elevated CRP, again, not in the 150, 200 range, but grumbling on at about 30 or 40, then I would be tempted to, you know, assess, is there any other reason for them to have this? If that is ruled out, and I think it is only a long COVID, I would be uh, tempted to continue the anticoagulation. And one of the questions that has never been answered, because now we are clearly not in the infective stage, Definitely not somebody who's continuing to shed active virus. We've moved on to an inflammatory state. Is there a role in such a patient for a low-dose steroid? I think nobody has answered that question, but that's something that needs to be answered in the long run. Another practical question would be a quick answer. I can see that. Mild COVID infection patient post-discharge complained of severe gastritis on ecosporin. Would you advise Copidogrel or any other? If I'm sure there's no uh, bleeding already, yes, definitely. Uh, I would take him off aspirin, especially if he has a previous history of aspirin-induced, you know, gastric erosions or anything. I wouldn't even have started him on aspirin. I would consider Clopidogrel. But again, it's a risk-benefit ratio. And we know that with Clopidogrel, you have much longer duration of the antiplatelet effect. And if I'm confident no procedure is planned for this patient in the near future, I would definitely keep him on clopidogram. Yeah. I, I would suggest from a surgical point of view, we would be happy if you can do on a patient who's off clopidogram at least for five days. 
aspirin, we can uh, calculate the risk. We can proceed. Should we do D-dimer study in all cases of COVID? Dr. Sweta, I remember. Uh, in the acute phase, yes, I would definitely think so. I think it's a very useful marker. As I already mentioned, it's not, uh, it's not wise to depend on a single marker. Just today, I got a query from a patient who's extremely anxious because he's fine. His oxygen is okay. He's completely asymptomatic. Uh, all his markers are down except for an LDH, which is a little elevated. And he messages me repeatedly, am I going into the cytokine storm syndrome? Uh, so I would go by the clinical picture, backed up by a couple of markers at least, if not three or four. After all, we have a nice panel of five markers. So I would not use a D-dimer alone. I would look at the cross-section of all the markers and still base it on the clinical picture. And that's very important. I think you never go by, you never treat the lab reports as we always say, you treat the patient. So you have to look at the patient and take that decision. But yes, I would do the D-dimer, I would do the LDH, I would do the CRP, I would do the ferritin in the acute phase. In the long run, I would take off several of these and maybe concentrate only on the CRP and the D-dimer. Yeah, again, reiterates your point, uh, stating treat the patient, not the investigation. True. Again, Dr. CVK, some CVAs we have encountered at ER itself we have found that they were RT-PCR positive. Can thrombotic CVA occur in the early phase of COVID? I mean, he probably says, is can it be a presenting feature of COVID? It can, absolutely. Uh, I've seen one of the patients I didn't put because it is not my patient. It was my secretary's brother, who unfortunately had a road traffic accident, had a fracture of both bones of the forearm, and I think a hip uh, fracture. A young man, 38-year-old was taken into the nearest hospital, was advised surgery. When they were doing the pre-operative workup, as a matter of routine these days, you know, the RT-PCR was done and he turned out to be positive. The next day, before they could take him up for surgery, he developed a massive internal carotid uh, blockage, complete uh, blockage of the left internal carotid, had a massive infarct, 38-year-old man. And he was completely asymptomatic from the uh, COVID point of view, but he was still RT-PCR positive. We do see this. There are two possibilities. One is you're still seeing them in the acute phase, at which point already the person is in a prothrombotic state. The other is we know that the RT-PCR can remain positive in some people, even for a couple of weeks. It's unusual, but it can be. This is not live virus. It is dead virus or non-viable virus because we don't know really viruses are alive or not. So a non-viable virus, a non-replicating virus is probably a better term. And that can carry on for a couple of weeks, which brings it well into the ambit of a post-COVID uh, thrombosis. So you can get it in the acute phase, you can get it in the post-COVID phase. Role of urokinase in severe COVID with ID dimer. Did we take that question? We took that question and we said no, no role, unless there's a thrombosis uh, definitively demonstrated. Uh, this go back, goes back to your talk. Arterial thrombosis in right upper limb in severe CO COVID cases was noted despite anticoagulation. Patient underwent embolectomy. What could have been done differently? Uh, I'd like to ask if it was, you know, therapeutic or prophylactic anticoagulation. And we know that uh, prophylactic anticoagulation has a certain measure of failure like any drug. I don't think we can say that every drug works. Secondly, we need to find out whether the uh, amount of prophylaxis that was given is appropriate for weight. Very often we use a standard thing and don't take the weight into account. I think it, the body weight has to be taken into account. And thirdly, I think, you know, it tells you very clearly that giving prophylaxis is not the end of the story. You have to follow these people up and maintain a very high level of suspicion in order to pick up a problem and treat it early, which seems to have been done in this case. They recognize the arterial thrombosis in the upper limb and went in and did a, you know, a removal. Uh, I'm not sure. We had a catheter-directed thrombolysis followed by a surgical removal. So, and I think that needs to be done. You've got to save the limb. Yes, absolutely. I mean, we use a lot of anticoagulation as uh, cardiac surgeons. So, sometimes despite patient being on anticoagulants, aiming for an INR of 2.5 to 3, they still develop uh, thrombosis. So it varies, 
And again, probably the patient needs a higher, his threshold is pretty high. And then sometimes you have to switch the anticoagulant and it works Absolutely. from the other. Excellent. And post-COVID vasculopathy can occur after three months and can lead to PE. Question from Bareilly, Dugesh Kumar Sani. I'd agree. I mean, I think he's stated his opinion and I would agree with him. I think it is possible. Wonderful. I think, I think uh, the other questions are more or less there is an overlap on it. Uh, I don't see anything else. Unless I've missed a question, any of the participants could please resend it because there's been a lot of about 30, 40 questions I could have missed out. So we'd be really happy to take it. We have time. And talking about tomophobia, uh, you know, interestingly, surgeons, even an operator, has the fear of this procedure. And what is the phobia for that? That we need to find out. I'm sure all of us go through that, especially interventional. I do go through it every day when I go into theater uh, because each patient is different. Each is alive. Uh, you cannot take anything for granted. And talking of out of the box, Judy was a perfect example of Dr. Murli Mohan, especially, I'm sure he didn't hear his uh, CV, I don't know. I changed your CV a bit, uh, modified it with your permission, asked for the permission from the participants. Uh, uh, it is, that's thinking out of the box. I'm sure people will be interested in knowing haiku, your obsession with haiku. <laughs> Yeah, it's 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 something that I've I've enjoyed doing. Uh, for people who don't know about haiku, haiku is a form of Japanese poetry. It has basically three lines, and it follows a very strict scheme of the number of syllables per line. So it's got to follow five syllables in the first line, seven in the second, and five in the third. And the reason I like this is it's often nature based, um, and it's got Within that very small framework of 17 syllables, uh, you've got to convey an emotion. Uh, and so that demands a lot of rigor. You know, you've got to uh, be very disciplined in what you write. So you start off with an idea which is very large and you've got to bring it down. And what I find is very often in the process of cutting it down, you actually concentrate the emotion and you make it even better. And it also allows you doesn't allow you to be very slipshod in your approach because you've got to stick to that, you know, very definite criteria that they want. So that is why I, uh, th that's why I like it. The Japanese also fascinate me. They are a, they are a culture of opposites. You can have, you know, the most cultured, some of the finest sentiments that come out like Ikigai and, you know, uh, respecting things that have been broken. You still value them and you repair them with love and with value. On the other hand, they are responsible for some of the worst atrocities during the Second World War. Uh, they have great contempt for people they defeat. So you have a culture which gives you both extremes of humankind. Uh, and yet at the same time, one of the most disciplined cultures. So they are a fascinating culture. So that combination of that brilliant culture with the discipline that the haiku needs is, is what fascinates me about it. Some breaking news. India just whitewashed England in the Wonderful. third test by 10 wickets. So uh, less news for today, sir. <laughs> absolutely. Talking about the Japanese, and there's a small sort of link with uh, the cardiomyopathy we have in COVID. We have cardiac uh, myocardial injury. We have uh, myocarditis. We have dysrhythmias. You know, that could cause death suddenly, all of a sudden cardiac death. There's an interesting entity known as Takotsubo cardiomyopathy. I have particular interest being a surgeon when we do very complicated cases. And this has also been related, uh, reported in COVID patients. This particular cardiomyopathy is, uh, can be due to stress. And the stress part can be emotional. That's also got a fancy name known as broken heart syndrome. I'm sure many of us here have experienced that. <laughs> The other thing is when there's a physical stress, for example, COVID or surgery, what happens is there is a there is cardiac failure. However, this they term as temporary cardiac failure. And they say it should revert. 
the shape of the muscle changes and the pumping effect, the capability, the, the ability is decreased. And this is, is really nothing much to do. But unfortunately, I have had adverse experiences where we have even lost the patient, right? even despite putting them on balloon pumps. Anybody or your experience with this stress cardiomyopathy uh, in your practice in this COVID days? No, I haven't seen any in COVID era, uh, but we've had Takutsubo, a uh, young lady, a doctor herself who underwent a uh, thoracoscopy. She had a, uh, an empyema, so we did a medical thoracoscopy. Uh, she was also going through severe marital stress at the same time. So I'm not, uh, we don't know whether it was anxiety about her disease. She was extremely anxious about her disease. Uh, she had not been married for a very long time and she was already facing a lot of marital stresses. Uh, we don't know what caused it, but she went into a classic Takotsubo cardiomyopathy, echo proven, uh, went into severe shock, fortunately came out of it and has recovered with no residual effects. Uh, but it was touch and go for some time. So what you tell me, sir, I can completely relate to. I've not actually seen it in COVID. I'm surprised because patients go through such intense fear of this condition, even when they don't need to be afraid. True, true. A word about the surgical aspect about COVID and the lung is uh, when you talk about the lung, what we have seen, uh, I, I work in a COVID hospital, but we don't have they have hardly called us, maybe in the last one year, touching one year, we have operated on about eight cases, but largely it's due to persisting bronchopleural fistula, empyema, and only in two cases did we have to do a resection. Otherwise, the role of the surgeon is much limited. However, I'm sure you guys are putting a lot of chest tubes, left, right, and center of patients on the ventilator. And further outcome in lobectomy, segmentectomy, one has to be very guarded, as opposed to be, say, a bronchopleural fistula, empyema, or a trap lung. We anticipate and we get good results. The patients we lost are after resection. And further going on to the vascular complications, the saddle thrombus, what we see in the pulmonary artery, uh, is very amenable to surgery when the traditional conservative management of medication and anticoagulants fail. What we do is put the patient on cardiopulmonary bypass and open the pulmonary artery. The saddle is the, where the pulmonary artery divides and we can go and clear it up, up to the branches, but we can't go distal. Suppose the distal vessels are blocked, then the whole uh, procedure is just an exercise. But the result is there for you to see immediately on table as soon as the procedure is over. At times, we don't usually extubate on table, but they could be extubate. Uh, the role of thrombectomy in, in best for peripheral vascular thrombosis is to put in an IVC filter. The role of venous thrombectomy, a few centers have tried, but not to much great success. Um, I don't see any other further questions, but I believe we have had a huge number of logins because of, of more than 750 logins. The number of questions being low is because you have been excellent, complete, exhausted, comprehensive, covered everything from A to Z. To Z. Uh, that's all I've got to report from my end. However, anything more before I sign off, we sign off, you'd like to say a few words? No, I'd just like to thank you for excellent moderation as expected. And of course, the CCI uh, for giving me this opportunity to talk about a topic which is fairly close to my heart. So. Thank you very much, sir. So on behalf of all the participants, we are grateful to the Chess Council of India, the efficient president, Dr. Narendra, the energetic secretary, Dr. Ravi Doshi, the rock solid, Dr. Pradeep Narayana, who was the co-founder, ever enterprising, Dr. Atri, and the excellent logistics support by, Dr. by Mr. Vipul Ranjan Shah of Simpla, Mr. Vinod Yadav and Mr. Pudeep Bajaj. Thank you so much and a super thank you to all of you and wish you a good night. Thank you, sir. And thank you to the technical team. I mean, this has been flawless uh, and so was the recording earlier. That was also excellently carried out. So thank you all very much.